Today we're going to start topic four. Topic four is on uh, biological membranes and eventually we'll talk about cell walls. Um, and this is kind of timely because actually lab three that we're going to be doing tomorrow is on um, membranes. So kind of good timing here. I like that when things line up. Let's talk about membranes and what a membrane is. So if you look at uh, your typical definition that you might see in a textbook on what a biological membrane is, it'll say something about being a semi-permeable layer. It might talk about being a bilayer. And uh, basically what it is, is, is it's, a, it's a layer that's separating the cell from the surroundings. Um, but that whole thing about being semi-permeable in that it's a, it's a layer that allows things in, allows things out. So a big part of membranes is of course, um, how they're being used for um, uh, transporting molecules. Uh, either wastes are getting transported out or nutrients are getting transported in uh, and those kind of things. So these are some of the, the things we're gonna talk about in this unit here. Uh, in terms of what are membranes made of, um, they're not just lipid bilayers, they include phospholipids, that's a big part. Proteins are another big part and some membranes contain carbohydrates. So we're going to talk about all three of those things uh, as we talk about membranes. Uh, another thing to consider is uh, the other things that are associated with membranes. So on the inside of a cell, uh, we're going to talk about the cytoskeleton. That's actually going to be more talked about in unit seven. And uh, at the end of this, so probably not today, but maybe on Friday, we'll talk about the uh, extracellular matrix, depending on how far we get with, um, uh, with this particular lecture. So let's talk about membrane parts. Uh, we've talked a little bit about macromolecules, and uh, so I want to talk about how they're put together in a membrane. So we'll talk about proteins, carbohydrates, and the phospholipids, uh, not necessarily in that order. Uh, first thing to talk about is the phospholipids, of course. Uh, this is the structural basis of your uh, biological membrane. So we talked a little bit about phospholipids when we were talking about macromolecules. And if you remember how a phospholipid is made, it's uh, basically made out of a little bit of glycerol. So here's my glycerol, like this. And it has uh, a couple of fatty acid tails. So these are my fatty acid tails. Fatty acids. And then there's a polar, uh, polar phosphate group. So we'll do this. polar group, and uh, it's not just a phosphate. Usually it is, uh, has something else on there. We'll call it a polar group containing a phosphate. So as a consequence, often we re represent our phospholipids as something that looks like that. You got the polar head, you've got those hydrophobic tails. So what happens when you throw these things in solution is the uh, hydrophobic parts uh, start to congregate together because they're not soluble in water. And uh, the polar parts can interact with water and you end up with what is called a phospholipid bilayer. And that's what's represented here in the middle of the screen. And they're kind of showing a, a chemical representation of that on the right. So these bilayers are the basis of the membranes and everything else is kind of embedded or attached to the membranes. Here's our um, phospholipid molecule. I should have this slide first, just to remind you what the structure looks like. Like I said, you've got this uh, polar region up here, this particular phospholipid, of which there are many. Uh, this one is called phosph uh, phosphatidylcholine, and uh, you can see it has a choline group on there. But really what's important is that group is polar and charged uh, due to the phosphate. And then the uh, bottom part here, the uh, fatty acids, is of course hydrophobic. And like I said, that really is the basis of this, of this whole thing. So this kind of molecule is kind of unique. Um, it's got polar parts, it's got hydrophobic parts. And so this molecule is actually has a special name and it's called amphipathic. And uh, so if you ever hear that term, it means a molecule that has kind of those dual personalities. It's hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, at the same time. So it can interact with water and it can interact with hydrophobic things. So by the way, uh, we are gonna talk about archaea in uh, topic five. Um, we mentioned them a bit at the beginning about uh, classification of organisms and archaea being kind of their own unique group. Uh, one way that they are unique is in their, uh, um, in their phospholipids. 
So if you take a look at this, I was just talking about the uh, uh, phospholipid bilayer. And this is uh, true for bacteria and eukaryotes. They have um, these phospholipids in the form of bilayer. Archaea, on the other hand, uh, they have uh, unique lipids in their membranes. Some of them are branched, and some of them are actually found in, um, as these unique kind of monolayers. So their membranes can be a little bit weirder and unique. So just another reason why archaea are, are different. And like I said, we'll come back to archaea in topic, uh, topic four, or topic five, I mean. So besides the fossil lipids, we also have proteins. And uh, so the proteins you can see uh, can be found in different varieties and versions. And uh, um, if you take a look at this uh, slide here, uh, you can see that uh, some of them are embedded, meaning they're, they're right inside the phospholipid layer. And so these ones here we call integral proteins. So these integral proteins are integrated into the, into the bilayer. If you go back to this previous slide, you can see it's pointing out that this section here is all hydrophobic, right? So this includes the, uh, uh, the lipids, and it includes those uh, sections of those, of those proteins. And uh, that part of the protein is gonna have a bunch of hydrophobic amino acids. And, uh, and that's how they're soluble within one another because you've got a hydrophobic protein. So if you're ever looking at an amino acid sequence, if you're ever looking at a protein sequence, that's one way to know that it might be a, uh, might be a membrane protein if you've got these long stretches of, uh, of hydrophobic uh, sections of amino acids. So those are called integral proteins. Uh, the other types of proteins, the ones that are kind of loosely associated with the, um, um, with the membrane are called peripheral proteins, and they can be attached in a variety of methods. Um, they can be attached to the phospholipids, they can be attached to other, other proteins. And uh, there's, there's many, many types. I know I have at the top there more than 50 types. The number's probably hundreds, quite honestly, of different types of membrane proteins. And like I said, they come in a variety of uh, shapes, sizes, and, and the way they do things. Uh, a lot of these membranes, proteins are also described as a transmembrane, which is kind of used synonymously with uh, integral. And uh, you can see uh, the way that these things are shaped and that we have these alpha helices. And uh, these alpha helices, like I said, are gonna be loaded with hydrophobic amino acids. Uh, so one alpha helix is about 20 amino acids, about 20 amino acids uh, to get across a membrane. And uh, I'll show you some other varieties. Here's uh, some other varieties of different types of membrane proteins. You can see you can uh, pass the membrane once, you can, um, have multi-pass transmembrane proteins. Uh, some of them are attached by other mechanisms. You can see this one here uh, is um, anchored by a lipid. So the protein is covalently bound to a phospholipid. So it's a little bit different, uh, but still technically a membrane protein because it is attached or anchored to that, uh, to that membrane. You can see the peripheral protein is shown here uh, on the right, which is not attached to the membrane, but is attached to another membrane protein. So kind of a little bit of a different system. So like I said, they come in all sorts of varieties and that's kind of the way uh, pretty much anything in life is. There's, there's lots of variety. Uh, here's a protein that I worked on. You can see it has a single pass of, a, of a, an alpha helix and most of the protein is actually found external uh, to the cell. So kind of, uh, kind of interesting and unique. So what are these membrane proteins doing? I think that is the next question. Uh, pretty much everything that proteins do. Uh, some of them are transporters, allowing things in or out of a cell. Some of them are enzymes. Some of them are involved in signal recognition. So for example, uh, hormones can bind some of these receptors. The receptors are made of proteins and they're uh, relaying a message inside the cell. Uh, some are involved in cell-to-cell uh, -cell recognition. Some of them are kind of like uh, rivets. They're attaching your tissues together. And uh, what's the last one I have on there? And some of them are involved in um, attachment to other uh, features, such as the extracellular matrix or the cytoskeleton. And, and those are things we're going to talk about eventually. So we'll get there. So the last group of, um, of things that make up membranes is uh, carbohydrates. And these are found uh, in much smaller quantities, and they're not necessarily found in every membrane. Uh, uh, they're a lot more likely to be found on uh, eukaryotic organisms. 
And if you take a look at this, um, these carbohydrates are uh, not self, um, they're not alone. They're not just a uh, carbohydrate. Uh, they're usually attached to something. So they're in different forms. Glycoprotein is one form. So remember glyco, remember glyco means carbohydrate and protein means protein. So now we have a carbohydrate attached to a protein. So lots of these carbohydrates are glycoprotein. Uh, some of them are glycolipids, which basically means the carbohydrate is attached to a lipid instead of a protein. Uh, so these um, proteins and lipids are uh, what we call glycosylated. So by glycosylated, we mean we've attached um, a carbohydrate to something. And uh, typically for proteins, that's done in the endoplasmic reticulum or the, uh, or the Golgi body. So the other question is, what is going on with these carbohydrates? Where are they and where are they? what are they being used for? Um, so if you look at this diagram, you may notice that uh, all of these carbohydrates are outside of the cell. So this is the outside, this is the inside. And so it turns out that most of these carbohydrates are involved in cell-to-cell -cell recognition. So this is really important if you are a complex multicellular organism. So think about your body. You have uh, connective tissue, you have skin tissue, you have bone tissue, heart tissue, neurons. Um, it's important for your body uh, and your body systems to be able to uh, kind of um, sort out and understand which other body parts they're interacting with. And uh, so, you know, your immune cells might come along and they're like, oh, okay, this is the, uh, you know, this is a lymph node or this is the thymus. And, and, and so these things are really important. They kind of come out being important when uh, probably the most familiar uh, uh, glycoproteins are the blood types. So you may or may not know your blood type, but the typical blood types are A, B, O, and A, B. And um, the blood types uh, are just different carbohydrates. And so um, the, uh, the practical application is that if you need a blood transfusion, uh, you better get the right blood type because if you don't get the right blood type, uh, it could be fatal because uh, your body's gonna recognize it as something foreign, have a massive immune response that can lead to death. Uh, obviously important for transplants and, and, and uh, all those types of things. Um, but like I said, it's really just a, a, a way for a complex uh, body to recognize its different parts. You can kind of think of them as little tags, a little tag that says what kind of tissue this is. This is a red blood cell. This is a white blood cell and so on. And that's what these glyco, uh, uh, proteins and glycolipids are all about. Okay, so I want to um, show you guys a few uh, here and there. I want to show you a few uh, multiple choice type questions. And I uh, also want to show this to you as a reminder that on Moodle, I have some sample questions sort of test yourself type of uh, multiple choice questions. And it's really important that you go through these and review them and get some practice. A lot of students are not as practiced as multiple choice as they'd like to be. And also to get a flavor for what you're going to see on the midterm. Um, it's really important that you, you do that because it's gonna help you to study. Uh, if you take a look at this question here, um, it's, it's a good one because it's using a lot of the language of the course that we just used, right? So you can see integral proteins, peripheral proteins, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, um, all of those words are important. And it's important as you study that you learn what these words actually mean. So this question here, we're just gonna go through them one by one. It said here, which of the following is not true? Okay, so we've gotta be able to understand the language of the course. The first one, it says, uh, integral proteins are found embedded within the phospholipid layer. Um, so integral is integrated and embedded, so that is correct. Uh, by definition, integral proteins are embedded uh, within the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, peripheral proteins are loosely associated. So yes, and, and again, by definition, peripheral means uh, um, not, not tightly bound kind of thing. It means, you know, they're, they're sort of accessories. And uh, so that is, that is also correct. Uh, C, membrane proteins can be channels that allow molecules to pass through the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, that is also true. Remember all those functions of membrane proteins that we talked about. I said that uh, they can be enzymes, they can be channels, they can be a variety of different things. All the things that proteins do, membrane proteins can be those things. Uh, D says integral proteins must be comprised of most hydro hydrophilic amino acids. So remember the integral ones are embedded. So that phospholipid bilayer 
is not hydrophilic. The uh, inside of the, hot, of the uh, fossil of the bilayer is hydrophobic. So this is the one that is not true, and that is the correct answer. Last one, it says peripheral proteins can be enzymes. Yes, they can be. They can be all sorts of, have all sorts of different functions. So you can see that is the correct answer. Uh, you could change it to being uh, uh, true if you add hydrophobic instead of hydrophilic in there. So like I said, I'm hoping you will practice those uh, uh, um, quizzes that I have on Moodle because um, they're gonna help you to get through the course and um, you know we do want you to perform well in the midterm. All right, so taking all of these things that we have together um, makes a model of the membrane. And, and the, the basic kind of most accurate model of the membrane that was proposed actually in the 1970s now is the fluid mosaic model. And uh, the fluid mosaic model, if you think about this, it has two parts, fluid and mosaic. So the fluid part is referring to the phospholipids. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. And the mosaic, a mosaic is kind of like a patchwork. And so you can picture a patchwork of proteins embedded in this, uh, this sea of phospholipids. So let's talk about those phospholipids a little bit here. Um, I have a little bit of information about phospholipids. Um, actually, before I get to that, uh, just some historical stuff in terms of how we understand um, membrane structure. Uh, one is a technique kind of going back to our last unit, a different type of a scanning electron microscopy. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how this part is done uh, precisely, but basically they freeze a membrane and uh, in liquid nitrogen or something like that. And you can see they're, they're taking a knife somehow and cutting it and then peeling, um, peeling it away. And so if you think about when you peel a piece of fruit like a banana, uh, it, it peels along a path of least resistance. And so the skin comes off and it leaves the fruit inside. In the case of a membrane, the path of least resistance is right here, actually between the two layers of the phospholipid bilayer. And then they do some scanning electron uh, microscopy. And, uh, and, this, uh, and you can see all those uh, proteins embedded. And so that's one kind of piece of evidence that shows that the, uh, the mosaic part anyway. Uh, what about the fluid part? Um, here's another classical historical experiment done to show the fluid part of the experiment is they took two cells. Uh, I'm not sure whether they used a mouse cell and human cell, but they labeled proteins on the surface of these cells with uh, fluorescent markers. And so what you can do with these two things, the original colors, by the way, were red and green, but they've, they've changed the colors in a lot of textbooks now to get away from that because, of course, a lot of people are red, green, colorblind. Uh, so they're using pink and purple here. I guess that's better. Uh, but what you do is you take these cells and they can be uh, basically merged together uh, using a, a certain type of detergent. And so their, their membranes fuse together and then they just watch them. And after time, they can see that the proteins um, are actually moving in, in the uh, phospholipid bilayer. Here's a little animation showing that. You can see the, uh, the little fusion event going on there. And then the uh, uh, the membrane proteins kind of moving around. So all this has been verified experimentally. So let's talk about these phospholipids a little bit. Um, the phospholipids can move uh, and they can move um, kind of in two directions, right? One is that they can move laterally. So laterally kind of means they're moving back and forth sideways. Uh, they, can, they can also twist as well, right? So they can, they can uh, spin around a little bit uh, very, very easily. And uh, you can kind of think of this, like I said, like an ocean of phospholipids, uh, although uh, not three-dimensional. This is more like a flat two-dimensional ocean, I guess. Uh, they don't usually translocate or flip-flop. You can see that shown here on the right, because of course, if you're gonna do that, uh, you're gonna have to try to get that polar head through the hydrophobic layer, which is not easy to do. So there's a little video here. You can, you can see them moving around. It's just a short video, but it, uh, it just kind of shows the whole principle. And you can see the proteins as well uh, moving around, uh, just like the, uh, the phospholipids, but nothing is flip-flopping. So a little bit more about those, um, about those lipids in, in terms of um, uh, what is determining fluidity. Um, one is the length of the fatty acids. 
uh, longer fatty acids are larger molecules and they tend to be uh, 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 less fluid. Uh, larger molecules tend to be uh, more solid than liquidy, uh, and all due to those London dispersion forces. Um, another thing is the saturation. Remember, we were talking about saturated and unsaturated fats. Remember, these saturated ones tend to be uh, more like butter and fat at room temperature, and the unsaturated tend to be uh, more liquidy. So organisms can actually control the fluidity of the membranes by changing their, their um, uh, phospholipids by, by uh, altering these things. Uh, you can see this is showing the, uh, the fluid ones that are, are unsaturated on the left and the, uh, the saturated ones on the right are stacking better. And so you get a little bit more of a, a solid and less, uh, less fluid type of, uh, type of membrane. Uh, the third is the presence of cholesterol. And I'm not going to get into all the details on cholesterol. It kind of takes a while to describe what is going on. Uh, but cholesterol can embed into membranes. And in fact, it has this little polar section here. And you can see the little polar section is shown on the diagram there on the right, uh, interacting with the uh, polar heads. And the hydrophobic section can embed in the membrane. So cholesterol is found in animal membranes, by the way. This is why if you eat animal products, those, those products are a source of cholesterol. And you don't get cholesterol from, from plant products. They actually have different st uh, steroids in their membranes. So what is cholesterol doing? It's a little bit of a homeostasis here. Well, what cholesterol does is it kind of fills in the gaps when things are too liquidy and kind of prevents things from stacking too much when it's, uh, when it's too solid. And so what it does is it kind of broadens the homeostatic range and optimizes that fluidity of the membranes. You can read about it in the textbook. I'm not gonna get into it in any more detail. Uh, if, unless you have, if you have any questions, you can always ask me at any time, of course. Okay, so something I have asked on the, on midterms before is uh, I've asked questions about the fluid mosaic model. Um, usually, the, my my question might be a bit more specific than this. Um, usually, it's kind of a five mark question. So, for example, I think last winter I had a question that said, you know, with the aid of a diagram, describe the fluid mosaic model and explain what types of molecules can easily be transported across the membrane. So we haven't talked about membrane transport quite yet, but anyway, you get the idea. So the fluid mosaic model needs to address the fluid part and the mosaic part kind of at a minimum. So what does this mean? Remember the fluid part is going to include phospholipids and the, uh, and the uh, uh, mosaic part is going to include proteins. So when you're answering this kind of question, if it asks you for a diagram, draw the diagram. Um, shouldn't be too hard to draw a few phospholipids, right? So here's some phospholipids here. And uh, explain what they are. Don't just draw a diagram and expect me to know what it is, particularly if you're sloppy. You always want to label all these things. Notice I added a protein. So we can do this kind of thing relatively easily. Um, so like I said, you want to describe that that's a phospholipid. I'm not going to um, write out all the words here. Uh, something else you're probably going to do is tell us that this particular region here is hydrophobic. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into all the details on here, but this is, if this is a five mark question, you need to give me five things, right? So the diagram would probably be worth two marks and three marks would be your explanation of describing this. So talking about how the phospholipids have, have, uh, have um, hydrophobic fatty acid tails and they have a polar head, and how the, the proteins that are embedded have hydrophobic amino acids that are embedded into the hydrophobic zone. Uh, you know, so you want to use all those uh, words of the course and, uh, and give me a good description. Labels are going to help. Um, so this here is a peripheral protein. And again, I'm not going to write out the whole thing. We'll just call it a PP, or not a peripheral protein, sorry, that's an integral protein. So IP, and, uh, and so on, okay? Um, and so if you have any questions about that kind of thing, let me know. But ultimately, you need to know all the information in order to answer the question, which is where the studying is going to come in. But always give me lots, lots of detail. Detail is, is very, very good. I like details. Um, you may include some of these other things that we talked about. Uh, they're not necessary for the fluid mosaic model. We talked about glycoproteins, glycolipids, cholesterol, peripheral proteins. Um, sure, add those in. 
Uh, all those things are going to, you know, do better at convincing me that you know what you're talking about, right? That you know what a membrane is and or what its structure uh, actually looks like. So do make sure that you are complete in answering these kind of questions. Uh, I'll probably come back and talk about more midterm questions, but all these things are good to, to write down so that uh, you have an idea of what your um, uh, um, how to how to do well in the midterm. Um, I guess this is me drawing one out using PowerPoint. So you can see I've, I've got uh, quite a detailed drawing there. There's some cholesterol, there's some proteins, uh, integral and peripheral proteins. There's a, uh, uh, a glycoprotein, one of them. There's a glycolipid. Uh, and uh, you know, this took me a while to draw. You, you, you may not be as neat as this if you take a look at my hand drawing one. It's not as beautiful as I'd like it to be, but uh, you know, it, it gets the point across. Okay, uh, let me just check the time here, see where we're at. So that's kind of a, a quick tour of membrane structure. There's a lot of good information in the textbook that talks a little bit more about fossil lipids and cholesterol and things like that. Um, part B of this lecture is really talking about membrane transport. And um, so if you think about this, um, this, this membrane here, right? We've got this hydrophobic, and hydrophilic sections. And so what does this mean? So this means that, uh, that only certain things can really get through the hydrophobic zone quite well. Uh, one is water, uh, two is small molecules, and three is hydrophobic molecules. So oxygen and carbon dioxide, by the way, are these are kind of the two small molecules that we like to talk about. And they are also hydrophobic. So they can squeeze through uh, quite easily to get through the hydrophobic zone because hydrophobic likes to dissolve hydrophobic compounds. Um, what is so special about water? Uh, water is, um, it's very small, uh, very, very small molecule, and it's very, very abundant, right? Um, if you think about it, this entire thing is bathed in water. So it just, it just leaks through, basically. It's, it's not a problem for water to go through. But most other molecules, if you think about uh, anything that fits into that, uh, the other categories, so large things and polar, I guess we could also add charged, polar and charged, I kind of put into the same category. Uh, these molecules uh, are, are going to be um, blocked by that hydrophobic layer and aren't going to pass through very easily. So we're going to need mechanisms if we want to bring in food. That's what this really means. If you think about a lot of the food that our cells like these, glucose and things like that, these are, are polar molecules. So we're going to need to be able to get that in because the uh, cell does want to uh, does want to have the energy and wants to live. So I want to talk a little bit about the different types of transport. Not sure if I'll get through all the types today, but we'll see where we get. Uh, so the first type I want to talk about is something called passive transport. Okay. And um, I kind of um, use synonymously with that is usually the word diffusion. So in this case here, what we're looking at is things that can get across the membrane and they're not impeded by that hydrophobic layer. So in this case here, we're usually talking about, like I said, small things or hydrophobic molecules. So oxygen, by the way, the uh, structure of uh, molecular oxygen is like that. That is a nonpolar molecule. Carbon dioxide is like this, also nonpolar. So these fit both of those categories, they're small, and they are, um, are hydrophobic. And this is very good because our cells like to consume oxygen uh, and then uh, CO2, carbon dioxide is the waste product. So this is how we can get oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out. That turns out very, very easy. Uh, related to diffusion is osmosis. So what is osmosis? Osmosis is technically the diffusion of water. Right, so this is just diffusion, but now we're specifically talking about water. So if you take a look, there's that little animation, I'll play it for you again. And if you watch that animation carefully, I'll play it for you one more time. But you may notice that these large green things do not ever cross the membrane, whereas the uh, little water molecules do. So let me play that for you one more time, here goes. Like I said, water can travel freely across the, uh, the membrane quite easily. I have a little video for you here on the right I will play, and you can watch, you can see the water molecules uh, are going to freely pass through that membrane, that red dotted line is the membrane. 
And uh, we're also gonna watch what happens when you add salt to one layer. So if you think about it, once you add salt uh, over here on the left-hand side, this is 100% water. Over here on the right-hand side, I don't know what percentage is. I don't know how much salt they added, but it doesn't really matter. They've added uh, less than 100%. So in that case, you're seeing a net flow of water going and, uh, and moving towards the salt. And that's kind of the effect we saw in, in last week's lab when people added salt to their LEDA cells. We saw um, the, uh, the, the water go out and the chloroplast started to clump up. So this is osmosis. I know everyone likes to talk about osmosis uh, all the time. Um, and, uh, but that's what it is, just the movement of water. Uh, so some definitions for you regarding osmosis. Um, you may have heard of these terms. Sometimes we talk about a cell being in a hypotonic, an isotonic, or a hypertonic solution. So tonic really means um, dissolved substances or dissolved ions. Um, doesn't have to be ions, though. So dissolved substances, right? Iso means the same. So I want to start there. If you take a look uh, in this diagram, you can see the water is moving out and it's moving in the cell kind of at the same rate. So if you are um, an animal cell, in the case here, they're showing a red blood cell, uh, this is where you want to be. You want your solutions to be isotonic. And this is why our, our body controls all these things. And you know, when you drink uh, too much water or have too many electrolytes, you can balance that by excreting things in your urine. And uh, it, it does a very good job of balancing all the solutions your, your cells are bathed in. Uh, but if you take these cells and if you put them into other solutions, uh, it can be really bad for them. So if you take a look over here on the right, hypertonic. So remember if someone is, um, let's say hyperactive, they have too much energy. In this case here, hypertonic means there's too much, um, too many solutes. So it could be salt, could be something else. So in the case of uh, like when we, we added the salt to the allodea, suck the water out. And you can see that that uh, uh, animal cell on the right-hand side is basically uh, getting um, uh, drained dry from its water. Uh, on the other end, we have hypotonic. So hypo means less, right? If you're hypothermic, you don't have enough heat. Uh, I always think hypotonic uh, is easy to remember because hypo is sort of like hippo. Remember, you know, hippopotamuses are kind of big round animals. And so the cell is getting uh, big and round. And so over here, basically, we don't have enough solutes, not enough solutes. So in this case here, all the water is flowing into the cell and uh, causing it, in many cases, um, it's causing the cell to burst. And so this is obviously bad for animal cells. So animal cells, they want to be isotonic. So what if you're a plant cell? Uh, you can see this is the, um, the, the previous slide were some animations from the amoeba sisters. These are the uh, diagrams from the textbook. You can see the, uh, the um, red blood cell is, is very happy in its isotonic solution and not happy in the other solutions. But what if you are a plant cell? Uh, it turns out that plant cells uh, aren't as fond of isotonic. So you can see they will often get flaccid. And uh, so what's going on here? So plants have cell walls. And uh, you probably know if you get flowers from somebody that you love and they, uh, you know, everyone always says, put your flowers in water uh, and, or that's a way to make your vegetables crisp. And so what happens in this case is the water flows in and that's a good thing because the cell wall prevents the cell from bursting. And we'll talk about cell walls uh, a little bit later, but the cell wall is actually outside of the membrane and it's a rigid layer and gives the, uh, the cell uh, lots of shape and structure. So the water flows in and the cell becomes crisp or turgid uh, compared to flaccid. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, if you throw your, um, your, your flowers in salt, um, the water is gonna get drained out and you're gonna see your cell gets plasmalized. So you can see the, uh, the membrane here is getting separated away from the cell wall. The, uh, the chloroplasts here are kind of clumping in the middle and um, the cell in that case is just gonna die. So don't put, your, um, don't put your flowers in salt water, please. Although there might be some exceptions for salt water flowers. I don't know if there's anything like that you can get from a flower shop, but uh, 
might be worth looking into. So the question is, what, uh, what can we do about this, uh, this situation? Uh, it turns out there's quite a few organisms that live out in the wild that don't have cell walls, uh, but they do have mechanisms for dealing with uh, this excess water. Uh, one organism we're gonna look at in lab five is this one here called a paramecium. And so a paramecium has no cell wall, but it does have what is called a contractile vacuole. So if you take a look uh, right where I have the, um, the arrow on the video, if you watch carefully, uh, every few seconds, I'll just wait and it's getting ready. You can see it's sort of uh, moving and then it's sort of, it's like a circle that shrinks. Uh, just watch it there. I'm waiting for it to do it again. There it goes. So every 10 seconds or so, you're going to see that the circle is shrinking. And then uh, and that's basically the organism pushing the water out of its, out of its cell. And uh, so that's one thing you can do if you don't have a cell wall. You can just pump out the water. And uh, there are a number of organisms that do this kind of thing. So back to the LODIA. Uh, this goes back to last week. Uh, this is your Elodea here on the left, and you can see all those uh, all those chloroplasts, all these little things here are chloroplasts. And uh, when you added the salt, um, you probably saw something like this, the clumping of the chloroplasts. Uh, this little thing here on the right is actually, or on the left, is actually a video. And if you're watching it right now, um, looking at the one on the left, you're going to see the, um, uh, the chloroplasts start to clump. Uh, just as uh, as the salt is draining the water out of those cells. And so you can see it's going to look like those plasmalized ones there on the right. So just a short little video, but you can see that it happens relatively quickly. Okay, so that was osmosis and diffusion. And uh, in those cases, um, you just have a molecule. And it's usually found at a higher concentration and it moves towards a lower concentration. And that's really what the fusion is all about. Um, and it doesn't need any help. It, these are things that can get across the membrane all by themselves. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, what if you need help? What if you are a polar molecule like glucose or um, let's say a salt uh, like sodium or something like that? How do you get across a membrane? Because you're charged or polar. So they need to do this uh, through something called facilitated diffusion. So facilitated means help. Um, and in this case, we're using something called transport proteins. Uh, they come in a variety of, of different types. Um, the kind of the two main types are channels or uh, what we call carriers or hinged proteins. So if you take a look, we'll look at that channel protein on the top. And really it's just a channel, meaning it's kind of like a hole. And that hole is going to be custom to a certain molecule. So you can see this example I gave you here is a sucrose horn, it's called. And it has these little holes. And this one actually has three of them sort of attached together. And that pore is uh, basically the right shape and size for sucrose to get through. And it's also going to complement sucrose in terms of molecular forces, right? It's not going to be a hydrophobic uh, environment, that little channel. That little channel is going to be a polar environment. And that way the, uh, the sucrose can get through uh, this porin here. Uh, there's another picture of it. You can see this one here is an aqua porin. Uh, so some cell types, uh, water can't diffuse fast enough. So they, they act, there's actually special proteins that allow water to travel through. And you can see the little water molecules they fit. It's the right size and the right polarity for the, um, for the uh, water molecules to uh, transverse that membrane. Uh, the carrier proteins are. Um, basically kind of like hinged gates and they open and close and you can see there's a lactose permease as an example even better if i show you this, uh, this little video here and you can see that uh, basically the molecules go in one side then the gate sort of moves and hinges and then they escape the other way although lactose is usually going in cells not out of cells but uh, hopefully you get the idea there Okay, so, so far we've talked about um, all passive transport, uh, meaning that uh, energy is not required. You're looking at molecules going from a high concentration to a low concentration. And uh, so we talked about diffusion, osmosis, and, uh, and facilitated transport. 
Uh, now we want to talk a little bit about active transport. So sometimes you're trying to get things across a membrane and uh, unfortunately uh, there's a higher concentration on and you know we want to move against the concentration gradient. So take a look at this here. Maybe this diagram isn't the best because it's showing uh, um, um, that's, that's a little bit better. Um, didn't realize I had an animation on the, on the diagram there. But basically, uh, active transport, active implies energy, is really what I'm getting at. And so if you want to transport something quickly or you want to get something against a concentration gradient, it's going to require energy. And that energy in a cell is usually ATP. So we will be talking about ATP a lot more in later units when we get to energy units. Um, but that's often the energy of the cell. And you can see that uh, this usually involves some sort of uh, protein, another transport type protein, and then energy. Like I said, usually in the form of ATP, although there are other forms of, of energy, of course. There's another um, animation showing the active transport and the utilization of ATP. All right, let me just do a time check here. Okay, we have a few minutes here. Um, I think I can get through some of these other things um, that I want to talk about. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, so let's let's just talk about a couple other things here before we wrap up. Um, there's ATP, by the way. And I showed you ATP uh, in topic two as a molecule. And remember that ATP is a nucleotide, okay? So let's not forget that ATP is a nucleotide. There's our nitrogenous base. So the nitrogenous base, of course, is adenine. We've got our pentose sugar. And we have our phosphate groups, of course. Um, so ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate because um, these two groups here together are adenosine. And they're attached together, they have that name. And then there's three phosphates. So adenosine triphosphate, ATP. And so when I take a look at uh, adenosine triphosphate, ATP, uh, I do notice something. And I notice it right away. I think to myself, look at all those negative charges and look at all of those oxygens, which oxygens are electronegative. So it turns out that uh, if you want to form that molecule and get all those negative charges together, uh, it actually takes energy. So I know that there's energy stored in those bonds. It means when I break those bonds, it's going to release energy. And that's exactly what happens when ATP gets broken down. So you can see here's the hydrolysis of, a hydrolysis of ATP shown on the bottom there. So remember, hydrolysis involves water. And uh, we make something called ADP. So ADP is diphosphate. So when we remove a phosphate, we release energy. And this can be used for a whole variety of things in the cell, which we're going to talk about a lot about that and starting around topic eight or so. Uh, notice one of the phosphates is broken down and um, it's represented as PI. So sometimes it's PI like this, sometimes it's P circled I, and uh, that stands for inorganic phosphate, meaning it's not attached to any carbon molecules like that. And that really does represent uh, something that looks like this. You don't need to know these chemical structures, by the way, but it represents basically uh, what's left over here. And it's gonna look like that. So that is, uh, that is my inorganic phosphate. Sorry for the messy writing here. It's writing on computer screens is never, uh, never easy for me for some reason. So that's, uh, that's ATP. Like I said, much more on ATP uh, when we get to uh, topic uh, eight, nine, 10, kind of in that range. So one area, uh, one, one uh, famous example of active transport, by the way, is the sodium potassium pump. This is found in your neurons, actually it's found in most tissues in, in some form. And I'll just uh, kind of briefly show you how it works. So notice it is actually a hinged kind of carrier protein. And um, it actually has binding pockets for three sodium ions. So what happens is those three sodium ions basically uh, bind in there. and uh, and then it doesn't do anything. It needs some energy in this case to actually move the hinges or move the carrier protein. And there's ATP. Notice ATP is going in. It's getting broken down into ADP. So that's going to get recycled. And little phosphate actually stays attached to the, uh, the, the protein. And so once it hinges and, uh, and moves, 
Now the sodium is found in the exterior environment and basically gets moved out of the cell. Um, but we're not done. This is a sodium potassium pump. So now that it's uh, open towards the outside, potassium can join in. So in this case here, we have um, two potassium ions can bind the, uh, the protein. Uh, so for every three that uh, sodium that exit, two potassium ions can go in a cell. And uh, that little phosphate group pops off. And basically that causes the, uh, the gate, the carrier protein to hinge in the other direction and the potassium can be released on the inside of the cell. So like I said, that's kind of one of the better understood and studied examples of, um, of active transport. Um, so here's kind of a slide showing the passive and the active transport. Um, there is one other kind of transport I want to talk about. I'm going to save most of that for next day. Um, and the last type of transport I want to talk about is uh, uh, really when we're moving large items. Okay, so the last type we'll call it bulk transport. And I'll show you very quickly uh, a slide and then we'll, we'll finish up for today. Uh, but no, oh, that's weird. So this is what bulk transport looks like. You can move things in, which is endo, or you can move things out, which is exo, and then cytosis. Cyte means cell, osis means process. So this means the process of moving things in and out of a cell. They're not very fancy words. Uh, and the way it works is this is going to involve a membrane compartment. So I'm going to leave that here for today uh, and just say, hey, we're going to come back to this next time. Uh, and uh, and this, um, this is also a form of active transport. It does take energy to do these things. Uh, in fact, quite a bit more energy because you're, you're forming and reshaping membranes. So that's, of course, going to take a lot of energy. Anyway, I will come back to this uh, next day. And uh, what I'm going to do is, I um, uh, can't remember what I was going to say, but we'll come back to this next day. And um, before then, I guess I'll see everybody tomorrow in the, uh, in the biology lab. So come prepared to do lab three, and uh, I will see you then.